And we can say amen to that, that the name of Jesus is the sweetest name. But you know, there's a name that's not sweet at all. As a matter of fact, there's a hideous name, an ugly name. It's the name Satan. It's the name Devil. Have you ever thought of the names that the Bible gives to the devil? Deceiver, liar, murderer, accuser, tempter, destroyer, evil one. When you hear those names, it makes you appreciate the name of Jesus all the more, doesn't it? Jesus, oh, how sweet the name. Now, it is in the name of Jesus that we overcome the wicked one, the devil. And I want to speak today on this subject, overcoming Satan or the devices of the devil. The devices of the devil. Now, when you were saved, you were not called to a frolic or to a religious playground, but you were called to a grim conflict with Satan. There is a battle. And the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. And you're not going to be successful in that battle until you, first of all, understand and know your enemy. And so I want to unmask some devices of the devil. And I want to give you this morning six deadly devices of the dirty devil. I want you to see what Satan does to undermine your testimony, to wreck your life, to overcome you if he can. Now let me say this, that theoretically Satan cannot. For Satan is defeated. At the cross, Satan was defeated. Jesus said, at the cross, now is the prince of this world cast out. Satan's head was crushed at Calvary. Satan's back was broken at Calvary. Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Satan is a defeated foe, and yet he's still gaining victories in lies because people do not understand that Satan is defeated, and Satan cunningly and craftily is deceiving and uh, using methods against people who do not understand what he's doing. Let me tell you something of his character. For example, in Ephesians 6, verse 11, the Bible speaks of the wiles of the devil. In the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 2, and verse 11, the Bible speaks of the devices of the devil. In 1 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 24, the Bible speaks of the snares of the devil. In the book of Genesis, the Bible speaks of the subtleties of the devil. The, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Now think of those things. Subtle. Devices. Snares. Wiles. Do you see how Satan works? Satan is so deceptive that he must somehow deceive you and he must do by wiles and snares and devices what he could not do outwardly, overtly, objectively. He must undermine you in order to get his work done. Therefore, you need to understand how Satan works. With that in mind, turn to the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, in the book of Nehemiah, we find a grand and marvelous illustration of the devices of the devil. Now, you better listen. There's nobody here in this auditorium who does not need this message. For what Satan has done is what Satan is doing. And there's no one here who is immune from an attack from Satan. Now, Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah is the book of the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. Look, for example, in Nehemiah chapter 1 and starting in verse 3. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass that when I heard those words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven, Nehemiah's heart was broken because the walls of Jerusalem were broken down, and Nehemiah set out with the help of God to rebuild the broken down walls of Jerusalem. Now, there are some modern walls that are broken, and we need some modern Nehemiahs to rebuild them. The walls of orthodoxy are crumbling, and Satan today has a juiceless brand of anemic preacher who has gone through the Bible and tried to explain away the great precious truths that we believe. These people who deny the law and defy the Lord, and these preachers who have gone through the doctrine of heaven and 
told us there's no gold there. They've gone through the doctrine of hell and told us there's no fire there. They've gone through the doctrine of the Bible and told us there's no inspiration there. They've gone through the doctrine of Christ and told us there's no deity there. And they tried to air condition hell and remodel heaven and explain away the devil. Why, the walls of orthodoxy have crumbled and they need to be rebuilt. Walls of freedom are crumbling. And communism, like a black cancer, is eating away at the vitals of our nation. And walls of freedom are crumbling. Walls of decency are crumbling. Sin that used to slink down the back alley now struts down the main street. And our world and our nation is cursed with sex-crazed, money-mad, demon-possessed people, and indecency and immorality flaunts itself and walls of decency have crumbled. Now God is looking for some people who will rebuild those walls. But when Nehemiah start, started out to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, he met satanic opposition. And when you start out to do anything good, anything great in the name of Jesus, you're going to meet opposition. And if you don't know that, it's time you woke up and found it out. I tell our new members, people when they get saved, if you've never met the devil, it's because you and the devil have been going in the same direction. You turn around and try and live for the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'll guarantee you, you'll meet Satan. Now, in the book of Nehemiah, we find out what Satan tried to do to keep Nehemiah from rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, and you can see what Satan is going to do to try to keep you from being a victorious Christian. And so I want you to notice these things that Satan did. I want you to notice six of his devices. Number one, we'll call derision. Would you look in chapter 4, verses 1 through 3? And we read, but it came to pass that when Sanballat, now Sanballat was one of the enemies of God, when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth, and he took great indignation and mocked the Jews. Underscore that word mocked. He mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, <laughs> What do these feeble Jews? <laughs> Will they fortify themselves? <laughs> Will they sacrifice? Will they, Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish that are burned? <laughs> Can't you hear him as he points the finger of derision? He doubles up with laughter and he says, Look at those feeble Jews. And his henchman Tobiah the Ammonite was by him and he said, Even that that they build, if a fox go up, he shall break down their stone wall. He said, They're going to build a wall and he says, If a little fox walks on it, It'll crumble, and they laugh, and they mock, and they scorn. Ladies and gentlemen, did you know that many a man, many a woman, many a boy, many a girl has been laughed out of a work for God? Did you know that there are many people who cannot stand the sting of ridicule? I'm one of them. I don't like to be laughed at. And I suppose that Satan could get to me easier by having somebody laugh at me than have somebody beat on me. People don't like to be laughed at. And especially with a new Christian, Satan uses the weapon of ridicule and the weapon of scorn. Now, it may surprise you to know that they laughed at Jesus. Did you know that? The servant is not better than his master. And you can read in the fifth chapter of Mark, verse 40, these words concerning Jesus. And they laughed him to scorn. Can you imagine people laughing at Jesus? They laughed him to scorn. They said, oh, 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 look at him. And they doubled up in laughter at Jesus. Can you imagine that? Why, the Bible tells us in the book of Luke that while Jesus Christ was on the cross, they derided him. They mocked him. They laughed at him while he was being crucified. And you make up your mind that if you live for God, the world is going to laugh at you. And if you're one that wilts and withers under derision and ridicule, you won't last long in the service of God. You better be prepared to be laughed at. They'll call you a do-gooder. They'll call you a narrow-minded fundamentalist. They will call you a blue nose. They will call you a fanatic. They may even call you a Baptist. They will call you all kinds of things. 
and they will point the finger of scorn and ridicule at you. And if you bring your Bible to work or if you bring your Bible to school or if you say grace at the table or if you witness for the Lord Jesus Christ, you had better be prepared for the finger of scorn for it is one of the chief tools of the devil. Well, what did Nehemiah do? I like what he did. I want you to notice his threefold way to get victory. First of all, notice in verse 6, he had a mind to work. So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. When the devil laughs, you just keep on working. And the way to prove that he's wrong is to do what God has called you to do. Let them laugh while you work. First of all, they had a mind to work. Secondly, they had a heart to pray. Notice verse 9, chapter 4, verse 9. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto God. Nehemiah knew that work was no substitute for prayer, and prayer is no substitute for work. One is not a substitute for the other. And if you don't have a heart to pray, never, for, never mind the mind to work because work without prayer is no good. But I'm glad that they did both. A man was caught out on a storm in a rowboat one night and his uh, servant was rowing the boat and, and uh, the boss said, uh, Sam, should we row or pray? He said, boss, let's mix them. Let's row and pray. And I think that's a good idea. We had a mind to work and we had a heart to pray. But the last thing that I want you to notice that they had was an eye to watch. Notice in verse 9, nevertheless, we made our prayer unto God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. That means, dear friend, when you look unto God, you also keep your eye on the devil. There are a lot of people who are watching the devil all the time who are not looking unto the Lord, and there are a lot of people who are looking to the Lord who are not aware of their enemy. But he had a, a, a will to work, a heart to pray, an eye to watch, and this is the way to overcome ridicule. You keep your eyes on the devil. I don't care how much you pray, you keep one eye on Satan. Sometimes you can get so heavenly minded you know earthly good. You can keep your eyes too much in the skies and not enough on the works of the devil. I don't mean to be overly concerned with Satan, but many Christians are ignorant of the devices of the devil. And so Nehemiah said, we worked, we prayed, and we watched. That's the cure for ridicule. Now make up your mind that you're going to be more concerned about the approval of God than you are the ridicule of men. You're going to be ridiculed if you try and live for the Lord Jesus Christ. If you can't take ridicule, you're not going to last. Satan is going to start out with ridicule and derision. All right, the second device that we find in this book. Look in chapter 4, verse 10. And Judah said, The strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed, and there is much rubbish, so that we are not able to build the wall. Now, they were halfway finished. Verse 6 tells us they were halfway finished. And here comes a fellow named Judah who says we can't do it. And there are always some Judas who say we can't do it. God deliver us from these people. It can be done, but it won't be done thanks to them. These kind of people are like a drink of water for a drowning man. They just come along right in the middle when you're tired and, and when you really need to be working together, and they say it can't be done. The second tool of Satan is discouragement. Discouragement. He will try to discourage you to keep you from doing a work for God. There are many of you who are on the very verge of discouragement. There are many of you who have started out to do something for the Lord Jesus Christ and Satan has whispered in your ear through some Judah, it can't be done. Some of you have taken a Sunday school class and you're about to give up. You say, oh, these boys are so bad, I want out of here. Well, who do you think needs a Sunday school teacher? Good boys? Let me tell you, that's why God put you in that class. But you're ready to throw up your hands. You're ready to quit. Some of you are ready to quit coming to church because you're discouraged. Some of you have had sickness in your home. Some of you have had financial problems. Some of you have tithed and yet you're still having financial problems and you're discouraged. And the devil whispers in your ear and he says, why don't you quit? You can't do it. It can't be done. I want to tell you, friend, that if you're discouraged, the devil is on your trail. There's an old fable that says that Satan was auctioning off his tools. And he was auctioning off lust and temper and pride and all of these tools. But there was one well-worn tool. And he had a very high price on it. And somebody said, what is that tool and why is it priced so high? He said, it's my best tool. The name of it is discouragement. He says, with discouragement, I can pry open a man's heart and get inside with any other sin that I choose. And this is true. If you're discouraged, friend, the devil is after you and God does not want you to be discouraged. Oh, I know you get tired. Judah was tired. I get tired sometimes. Somebody wrote, honey, I'm tired. 
I'm tired of sitting and I'm tired of sighing. I'm tired of living and I wouldn't mind dying. Honey, I'm tired. I'm tired of chicken and I'm tired of cake. I had a chill and I was too tired to shake. Honey, I'm tired. Well, maybe you are tired. But let me tell you this. The Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. The Bible says, be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you'll reap if you faint not. The devil is a discourager. And are you discouraged right now? I want you to rebuke Satan. Because if you're discouraged, you're in the first stages of backsliding. The first thing he tried was derision. That wouldn't work. And so he tried discouragement. And that didn't work either. And so the next thing he tried was danger. He started to play rough. Satan likes to play cute. He likes to play it cozy. He likes to be dainty and subtle if he can. But don't forget that Satan is also described as a roaring lion. And so read in chapter 4, verse 11. And our adversary said, They shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. Now, if they couldn't laugh them out of it, and if they could not discourage them away from it, the enemies of God's children said, we will put them to death. Now, how many people do you know who have, who have shed any blood for Jesus? Do you know I've been preaching for over 20 years, and I've yet to meet anybody who shed any blood for Jesus that I know of? Oh, we, we, talk about, uh, we talk about suffering for the Lord Jesus Christ. What do we know about suffering? We come sit here in an air-conditioned church on a cushioned pew, you know, and, and we sing, Faith of our fathers living still in spite of dungeon, fire, and sword, you know. Faith of our fathers, we will be true to thee till death. And don't even get back to the Sunday service on Sunday night. <laughs> and we'll be true to thee to death. And, and, and many people would not give up watching a football game for Jesus. Many people uh, almost choke and gag when you talk to them about giving one dime out of every dollar for the work of Jesus Christ. And friend, you haven't arrived when you start to tie. That's the floor, not the ceiling. That's the minimum, not the maximum. That's what a Jew did under the law. What would you do? What would you do if somebody threatened your life for Christ? What would you do if the same thing happened here when there were enemies who said, you deny the Lord Jesus Christ or we'll shoot you? That time may come, unless some of we who are Christians get a backbone where we've got a cotton string and stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. Here was the threat of danger. Satan will stop at nothing. Now let me, let me show you what uh, the threefold defense that old Nehemiah uh, did Notice, first of all, in verse 14. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and unto the rulers and the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them, remember the Lord. So the first thing he tells them to do of the three R's is to remember. Remember the Lord. Think about the Lord. It doesn't matter what Satan says. It doesn't matter how much he breathes out threatenings and slaughter. It doesn't matter how much he uh, holds the sword over your head. Remember the Lord. The Bible says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Jesus said, all power is given unto me. Jesus said, I give unto you power over all the power of the enemy. It's time we believe this, that we remember the Lord. Our God is not sick. He's not weak. He's not dead. He's not old. He's not worn out. He is mighty. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but spiritual and mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. It's time we got a fresh vision of the glory of God. Do you know that? It's time that we saw again how great our God is. And when Satan comes to intimidate you, I want you to remember what Nehemiah said. Remember the Lord. Think about the Lord, how great he is, how good he is. A little boy came to his dad, I'm told, and asked his dad, Dad, how big is the devil? His dad said, well, son, I, I don't know how big the devil is. He said, Daddy, is he bigger than I am? Well, yes, son, I guess he's bigger than you. Dad, is he bigger than Mama? Well, yes. Daddy, is he bigger than you? This little fella had been used to his big, strong dad protecting him. Is he bigger than you, Daddy? Yes, son, he's bigger than I am. The little fella's face clouded up, and the stinging tears came to his eyes. And then he thought one more time, and he said, Dad, is he bigger than Jesus? And his dad said, No, son, he's not bigger than Jesus. 
And then he said, well, I'm not afraid of him. You know, that's good, isn't it? Greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. Greater is Christ than Satan. Remember the Lord. Robert Louis Stevenson told about a boat that was on a rocky shore and there was a storm and this, this ship was being moved over toward the breakers and to the roaring, crushing rocks and, and it looked like the ship was going to go under. It was being tossed and turned and one passenger with great difficulty made his way up into the pilot house to see if he could talk to the captain to see if they were in real danger. When he got there to the pilot house and opened the door and he looked in and there was the captain, the pilot, at the wheel. And the pilot turned and looked at him and smiled. He went back and told the other passengers, he said, it's all right. He said, I've just seen the captain's face. And he smiled at me. Friend, let me tell you something. When it looks like you're going under, you need a fresh glimpse of Jesus. You need the smile of Christ. You need to remember the Lord. Jesus said, behold, I'm with you. All power is given unto me. Remember the Lord. Look upon the smile of Jesus and remember his promise. But not only did he call them to remember, but he also called them to reflect. Look in verse 14. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and unto the rulers and the rest of the people, Be not afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. Remember and reflect. All that you hold near and dear is in danger. Now you can sit here this morning smug, satisfied, sanctified, sublime and happy and thinking you don't have a worry in the world and you're not about to get in a fight for God. You feel like you've done God a favor when you get here on Sunday morning and sit down and sit here. And you're not about to enter into the battle. You're not about to be a part of God's invasion army. You're not about to be a prayer warrior or anything else because you think you've got it made. But Nehemiah said, I want you to remember God And then he said, I want you to remember the issues. There are some mothers who are sitting here this morning, unless you live for God and pray, your daughter may become the dirty plaything of a communist soldier. And your little boy may be raised in an atheistic university. Your children may fight in one of Earth's bloodiest wars. Your your boys and your girls may be sucked down in the swirling sewers of sin and become victims of dope and vice. And Satan hates your family. And Satan is not playing games. And Nehemiah says, now listen. Remember God and reflect upon your children. I tell you, it's time that we stood up and be counted. It's time that we stood tall and true. Remember, reflect, and then he says resist. I want you to notice uh, in verses 17 and 18. And they which build it on the wall, and they that bear burdens with those that laid it, every one with one of his hands wrought in the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. In one hand was a trowel, In the other hand was a sword, and that's the way God's churches are built, with a tool in one hand and a sword in the other hand, to build and to battle at the same time. And this is what we must do. We must be on the offense and on the defense at the same time. And the best defense is a good offense, but we must have a defense. Oh, friend, listen, we must resist the devil. Don't you know that if we resist the devil, he'll flee from us? Don't you know this? This is what James said in James chapter 4, verse 7. Draw nigh unto God, and he'll draw nigh unto you. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You have power over Satan. Don't let Satan beat up on you anymore. Don't let Satan do to you what he's been doing. He is a defeated foe. You don't have to pray for the victory. You can pray from the victory. The victory was won at Calvary. You take the sword of the Spirit and resist the devil. You've been giving in to him too long. I heard of an old tomcat who always got his tail stepped on. It seemed like everywhere he'd go, the poor cat got his tail stepped on. He got to where anybody knew would come in the house, he'd see them coming, he'd just turn around and lay his tail out and wait (laughs) till he got his stepped on. I know some Christians who are just like that. They just give in to the devil. They say, here it comes again. Well, it's time you went to Calvary and stood your ground. It is time you resisted. I am telling you, you need to remember the Lord, you need to reflect upon the issues, and you need to resist the devil. I don't care how much danger. The Bible says no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me. Isn't that a great verse? Praise the Lord for it. All right, now, the next thing. First of all, there was derision. Secondly, there was discouragement. Thirdly, there was actual danger. The next thing he tried was discord. Discord. He tried to divide God's people. 
read in chapter 5, verse 1, And there was a great cry of the people and of their wives against their brethren, the Jews. This was not done from the outside. This was done from the inside. Satan had succeeded in dividing the people of God. There was an argument. There was a division. There was discord. And this time it was over money. It need not have been over money. It could have been over something else, but frequently it is over money. And there were some people who thought that they were being impinged upon, infringed upon by some other people on the matter of money. And there got to be a division among God's people. Listen, friend. You've heard me say it before, and I'll say it again. The devil had rather start a church fuss than to sell a barrel of whiskey any day in the week. The reason for this is that there is nothing that hurts the name of Jesus, and there is nothing that hurts the cause of Christ more than division among brethren. The Bible says God hates him that soweth discord among brethren. <coughs> The Bible teaches in John the 17th chapter that one way that the world can know that Jesus is the Christ is when God's people are together. Jesus prayed in John the 17th chapter. He said, Lord, I pray for my disciples that they all may be one that the world may know that thou hast sent me. Do you see? That the deity of Christ is shown when we love one another. This is the reason the devil would love to divide us over something that does not matter. The Bible says God hateth him that soweth discord among brethren. The world is watching. Look in chapter 5, verse 9. Nehemiah was talking to these who were a-fighting and a-feuding and a-fussing. And this is what he says in verse 9. And I also said, It is not good that ye do. Ought ye not to walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the heathen, our enemies? He is saying that the church is on the playing field and the blank-faced heathen are in the stadium and they're looking at them and they see us fuss and they say with a sneer, behold how they love one another. Oh, he says there's the reproach of the enemy and when you and I bicker and when you and I fuss and when you and I let anything divide us, the devil rolls over with glee. It's one of the devices of the devil. And I'm telling you, my friend, if you're holding and harboring a grudge in your heart right now, you better get rid of it. And you better not look down your long nose at the drunkard. And you better not look down your long nose at the thief and the harlot because you have a sin in your heart that's grieving the heart of God. Is there anybody, I mean anybody, that you're holding on against? You better get rid of it. You're being a tool of Satan to keep the walls of God from being rebuilt. All right, now let's notice the next thing that Satan uses. If he cannot do it then with division, then he'll try and do it with deception. Notice chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had builded the wall. That is, it's no good to threaten them, it's no good to laugh at them, it's no good to uh, try to divide them. You can't do any of this. I heard that I had built the wall, that there was no breach left therein, though at this time I had not set up the doors upon the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. Let's have a love in, Nehemiah. Come on down. We've been enemies long enough. Let's come together and talk it over. Now, it sounds good, doesn't it? It sounds like now they want to be friends, but Nehemiah was not fooled. He says in the last part of verse 2, but they thought to do me mischief. And I sent messengers unto them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? He said, I am not coming. God has called me to do something and I'm not leaving to go down. You see, here is the snare of the world's friendship. If Satan cannot get to you as a roaring lion, Satan will try to get to you as an angel of light. Satan, if he cannot undermine you as a foe, will undermine you as a friend. Satan, if he cannot oppose you, will join you. But Satan, one way or another, will deceive you. And this sounds so good. So many people have been deceived by the devil, and so many people have been undermined by the devil when he comes up and puts his arm around them and smiles at them, but the Bible says that friendship with the world is warfare with God. Now, I believe in public relations. 
And I believe that the First Baptist Church of Merritt Island ought to put the good, best foot forward that we can. And I believe that we ought not to go around trying to stir up trouble with anybody, for the Bible says, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. I believe that. But I believe when the world starts putting its arms around us and trying to make us conform to them, and we say, oh, look now, everybody's accepting us, we better beware. Dear friend, those who live godly for Christ Jesus are going to suffer persecution. And don't think that we have to go down and hold a summit conference with the devil somewhere in order to be well thought of. And don't get all upset if somebody criticizes the First Baptist Church of Merritt Island. Of course they're going to criticize us. But the devil is very clever. He says, you come on now, and let's sit down, and let's have a little powwow. I heard of a big game hunter who was going out after a bear, and he saw the bear he wanted. He had his gun up, the hammer back, ready to fire, and the bear said, hold it. Hold it right there. He said, now come on out here in the middle of the road, and let's talk this thing over. Let's be reasonable. So now think about it. You want a fur coat, isn't that right? And all I want is a good meal. Now come on out here and let's talk about it. And the hunter laid his gun down and came out and they talked about it. And after the conversation, the hunter had a fur coat and the bear had a good meal because the hunter was inside the bear. Now that's the way Satan is. If he can't get you anywhere else, he'll say, come on, let's just talk about it. You see, let's just sit down. You come on down. Nehemiah said, I'm not going. I'm not going to get sidetracked. He said, I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. Now, he didn't say, I'm doing a great work. He said, I'm doing a great work. That's what he said. I can't come down. I am in business for my God, and I'm not going to compromise, and I'm not going to get sidetracked. You know, the devil loves to sidetrack you. He loves to put his arm around you and say, come on over here. I've got a little job for you. I'm going to get you elected as first vice president of the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Orphan Grandmothers with Athletes Foot. And you're going to be able to do such a wonderful job. Now, of course, you won't be able to teach Sunday school anymore, and you can't come to Invasion Army anymore, but come on over here. We're going to exalt you. You're going to be somebody wonderful. Would to God that some of us could be single-minded. We don't need to be members of any organization or fraternity or club or anything else that calls us away from the work which God has called us to. I'll tell you, one of these days when this earth is burned to a cinder and one of these days when the sun and the moon and the stars have grown cold, you're going to find out that the only thing that matters is getting men to heaven through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Come on down, Satan says. Nehemiah said, I'm not coming. I've got a great work to do. The apostle Paul was a mighty man of God, for he said, this one thing I do. This one thing I do. God give us some deacons and some Sunday school teachers and some people who are single-minded and who will not get sidetracked by the devil's deception and the devil's lies. Well, I must close, but one last thing that Satan did. I'm talking about dirty devices of the devil. The last thing he did, I suppose, was the dirtiest of all. This was defamation. He tried to slander Nehemiah. Notice chapter 6, verses 5 through 7. Then sent Sanballat his servant unto me in like manner the fifth time with an open letter in his hand, wherein was written, It is reported. Now notice this. You ever heard, I heard somewhere, they say, they say, it is reported among the heathen, and Gashmu saith it. Who on earth he was, I don't know. And Gashmu saith it, that thou and the Jews think to rebel for which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king according to these words, and that thou also appointed prophets to preach of thee in Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah, and now shall it be reported unto the king according to these words. Do you know what they were saying? They said, Nehemiah, there's a rumor that you're building a kingdom for yourself. And that's the reason you're rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. It's not that you really want to serve God. You just want to be a king. Why, the heathen are saying it, and Gashmu has said it, and there was a whispering campaign. There was a slander. You see, when a man tries to serve God, when a woman tries to serve God, when anybody tries to serve God, the devil will point his finger, and he'll say the same thing he said to God about Job. Ah, does Job serve God for naught? The reason he's doing it is for what he can get out of it. Have you ever heard anybody say, well, that preacher's preaching for money? Have you ever heard anybody say that man joined the church for business reasons? Have you ever said so-and-so goes to church because she can show off her dresses? Have you ever said that man just loves to hear himself talk? Have 
Have you ever heard people talk about people of God that way and slander them for the reason they serve God? I tell you, one of the names of the devil is slanderer. He's a slanderer. And you are never more like the devil than when you gossip. And when you slander, it is reported. Gash, Musaia. Oh, friend, you better ask God the Holy Ghost to set a seal upon your lips, and before you say anything about anybody, you better ask yourself three questions. Is it true? Do I know it to be true? Is it kind and is it necessary? And if it won't pass those three gates, you better not say it. One pastor kept a book on his desk. It was called Complaints of Church Members Against Other Church Members. Somebody would come in his office and start to say, blah, 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 blah. He said, wait a minute. Before you say that about brother so-and-so, let me get it down here. I want to get it word for word. Why are you doing that, Pastor? Well, I want to have you sign it at the end, what you say, so when the thing comes up, I can know who said it, and you can attend. Oh, he says, I wouldn't sign anything like that. Friend, if you can't say it and sign it, you better not say it. Amen? Gashmu saith it. It is reported among the heathen. Do you know what A.B. Simpson said? A.B. Simpson said, I would rather play with forked lightning than to speak a reckless word against any servant of Christ or idly repeat the slanderous words which thousands of Christians hurl at others. The Bible says, Speak not evil one of another, brethren. Slander, defamation, is one of Satan's greatest tools. The Bible says against an elder, Receive not an accusation, but in the presence of two or more witnesses. You be very careful before you let anybody slander a servant of God. Here was Nehemiah, a man with a great heart. Here was Nehemiah, a man with a heart for God. And the devil said, if I can't get to him any other way, I'll start a dirty rumor about him. If you think the devil's your good friend, he's not. The devil will stop at nothing. Nehemiah, however, just said, that's a lie. And he went on serving God. There's a victory that's ours. I must close, so notice verse 6, 15 and 16. And so the wall was finished. Isn't that great? You see, every weapon that was formed against him failed. Every weapon. So the wall was finished. And verse 16, And it came to pass that when all our enemies heard thereof, and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. Oh, that's great. The wall was finished. And everybody that was around, when they saw that it was done, they saw something was done that could not be explained by promotion, by personality, by psychology, by paraphernalia, by payment, or by anything else, that it was the work of God, to God be the glory, great things he hath done. And I long for a church where when the heathen look at it, they'll say there's only one way to explain the First Baptist Church of Merritt Island. It's not the pastor, it's not the buildings, it's not the organization. Their God is with them. Their God is with them. The, the, the legacy that is ours is this. Our God says, I give you power over all the power of the enemy. Thank God that we don't have to be ignorant of his devices. Now let us pray.